Hi, I'm Doug Munoz. Uh, I apologize right up front. I'm fighting a cold, so hopefully my voice will get through here. Um, I especially want to thank Bea, I guess twice now, first for creating the conference and inviting me to come and participate, and then for doing such a great job at introducing my talk, <laughs> except you stole some of my slides. But anyway, um, I'm going to carry on uh, right off where uh, Bea left off, coming back to the anti-SACAD task, really, and the difference is um, I do also monkey neurophysiology in addition to studying human patients or normal humans in a magnet scanner. And so I'm going to take us the other direction where we use this animal model to understand the circuit that's controlling this behavior so we can understand the behavior in the anti saccad task in exquisite detail. So uh, four things I'm going to try and accomplish this, uh, this afternoon and I'm going to have to go really fast and I apologize if I skip over some uh, core elements. I'm going to take advantage of Bay introducing a lot though. Uh, so I'm going to introduce you to the saccadic eye movement system because that's the system I study. That's what I'm interested in is how the brain controls saccades. It just so happens you need all parts of frontal cortex, parietal cortex, basal ganglia to do that. So just about any neurological psychiatric disorder is going to impact on your ability to control saccades. And then I'm going to introduce just a bit of monkey neurophysiology in a bit more detail than what Bay has showed. To, to really establish a couple of critical correlates that, we're then, that I then want to show you how we can exploit that when we go to human combined imaging and eye tracking. And then I'll show you some examples where we've actually done this with uh, subjects with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. So as I said, multiple areas in the brain um, control eye movements. And in many of these areas, it's only a small part. But this uh, figure just shows you how we basically just covered the entire neuraxis except the spinal cord and maybe the hypothalamus. So spinal cord damage, we don't know if it affects eye movements yet, but just about anywhere else in the brain if something goes wrong, as long as you design the right kind of paradigm, you can reveal the deficit in how the subjects are controlling eye movements. So I'm gonna put these areas now into a uh, circuit diagram. So first, the parts in the brainstem, the superior colliculus cerebellum uh, reticular formation here, this controls the eye movement. This generates, executes, accurately the saccade itself. So this is the motor machinery. And then, of course, the inputs to this motor circuit are vast. Uh, inputs from the visual cortex, of course. Uh, the, the frontal and parietal cortex, I know my postdoc advisor told me these areas of the brain just keep the superior colliculus warm and cozy, but maybe they have a, a few extra functions. There are eye movement areas in there. A lot of these, like dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, frontal eye fields we've been talking about already. For any basal ganglia aficionados, we have the complete direct, indirect, hyperdirect loops for exquisite for eye movement control. All of these inputs, you'll notice, are converging at the level of the intermediate layers of the superior colliculus. This is like the command structure to make saccadic eye movements. This is what I think is the equivalent of motor cortex for all other behaviors. Motor cortex does not have a representation for saccadic eye movements, and I think it's because it sits right here in the superior colliculus. And of course, the superior colliculus connects through the thalamus to all other parts of the brain. So I'm dazzling you with this uh, circuit that goes all over the brain. This is 40 years of research in multiple labs went in to make this circuit, and that's why this system is so good to study how the brain works. Um, I'm just going to introduce you quickly to some of the signals we can record in the monkey. So this happens to be dropping an electrode in the superior colliculus, but it almost doesn't matter. And often we get these same kinds of patterns of discharge across that circuit I showed you. So here's a monkey making a saccade. And in the superior colliculus, we can record from neurons we call saccad neurons that are going to discharge a high frequency burst that's going to make the eye move. And there are other neurons elsewhere in the colliculus that have a tonic discharge during fixation, they pause during those saccades and then that tonic activity resumes. So we've got this push-pull relationship between signals, burst signals trying to drive the eye and fixation signals trying to stop the eye from moving and hold it in place so the visual system can do a detailed analysis. And these two kinds of signals, fixation and saccade, aren't unique to the superior colliculus. They're in the reticular formation, they're in the superior colliculus, they're in the basal ganglia, they're in the frontal cortex, probably even all the way up to the parietal cortex. Just so happens in the superior colliculus, these are very clean signals. Um, we contrast what happens in the, um, 
anti-SACAD paradigm that Bay introduced with a pro-SACAD task, which is identical, except we use a, uh, an instruction, the color of the light in the center of the screen, that tells the subject, make a pro or an anti. And I want to introduce uh, one important feature of monkey behavior and human behavior in the pro SACAD task because it's critical for the anti SACAD data. So, this is a distribution of reaction times of SACADs from a monkey doing pro SACADs. And often we can have not a normal distribution, but a bimodal distribution in an early peak here of SACADs that are triggered within 100 milliseconds of a visual target coming on. This is very fast. This is like going from the retina up the visual system into the superior colliculus, down to the motor neurons and back out. There's no time to go to frontal cortex, basal ganglia, any of that. And humans and monkeys occasionally do that, these super fast reaction time saccades to a visual stimulus. So here we're recording from one of these saccad neurons in the superior colliculus. And this is a raster plot, so each row is a separate trial. Each tick mark is an action potential from this, trial, from this neuron. And the data are aligned on when the target comes on for a prosaccad into this cell's response field. So offline, we separate when the monkey made an express saccad and a regular saccad. So you see the regular saccad, two bursts. This first burst is visual. It's time locked to the onset of the target. The second burst is motor. It's time locked to the saccad. When the monkey makes an express saccade, we only get one burst. This visual burst becomes the motor burst. And I believe these are superimposed here. So this waveform I'm now showing is just a spike density waveform, which is just a filtered histogram of unit activity. The higher this line goes, the more active the, the unit is. And what you can see here for a regular saccade, there's the two bursts, the express saccade, one burst. But you see this elevated baseline, this preparation activity. And Bea started to allude to this a little bit in her talk. And this activity rides up so that that visual response will cross the threshold and trigger the saccade. So if we come back to our model, we believe that a saccade is triggered when neural activity crosses some threshold in the brain. And during a regular latency saccade, a target comes on, makes a visual burst on these neurons that are getting visual input, but it does not cross that threshold. And only later a signal comes along to cross that threshold. But if there's an express saccade, we see this elevated activity and this ramping up so that now that visual response crosses the threshold and becomes the motor command itself. Okay, now let's go to the anti saccade task. And I just want to go into behavior a little bit more than what Bea uh, introduced. This, these are uh, eye position traces from a young child doing this task, or maybe it was an older child, about 12 years of age. So there's a number of trials here. These are just eye position trials. anti saccade the fixation light was red. Here's the target comes on. They make anti saccades Those are the solid traces. This subject made three errors where they looked the wrong way, just like Bea told you when you make a mistake. Those are the dash traces. And notice how quickly they are often corrected. This is absolutely critical to see these corrections because now we know even when the subject made a mistake, they understood the task. They couldn't suppress that automatic reflex. And this gray bar is when these, this is this express saccade epoch, and that's usually where these errors come in. So this is this visual response going through and triggering the wrong saccade. So I'm going to elaborate now just a little bit more on the neurophysiology that Everling and I recorded in the superior colliculus and in the frontal eye fields. It was very similar, so let's just focus on the colliculus. For correct pro or anti saccade, when the stimulus was in the cell's response field, here's the pro saccade in blue, visual response, the motor response. And on the anti saccade trials, there's the visual response, and the cell gets shut off because the motor command has to come out of the other side of the brain. So I'm not showing you the neurons on the other side of the brain that would have a motor burst here in red to drive the anti saccade. I want to show instead in this talk what the, the fate of this visual response getting in the way. So when Stefan came to my lab, we wanted to train monkeys to do anti saccades. It took several months to get monkeys to do anti saccades. And the question was, when all that training, were we going to get rid of this visual burst? And you can see we failed on that. But you can see the reduced baseline activity on these neurons in the frontal cortex and in the colliculus on anti saccad trials. So something's coming in to turn those neurons down, some kind of suppression signal. And so 
you'll notice this big difference in the elevation of this baseline before the target even comes on. So now let me switch. Remember I introduced you the idea of these fixation neurons that are active during fixation and pause for saccades. Let's look at what they do for anti-saccades and pro-saccades. And so these fixation neurons are present in the frontal eye field and in the superior colliculus. And they have tonic activity and there's going to be a pause here when the pro or anti-saccad gets made. But what I want you to focus on here is the tonic activity of these fixation neurons during the instruction period. And you'll see that these fixation neurons have an elevated discharge on the anti-saccad trials. So we believe that's the suppression signal that's driving down the saccad neurons in this reciprocal push-pull. So to do a correct anti-saccad, you must boost this suppression signal to inhibit these saccad neurons so that this visual burst does not make an error. The system can't get rid of that visual burst, so it's doing everything else it can to minimize its impact on behavior. Okay, now, I, now let's look at what happens when the anti-saccad errors come. So this is a monkey now. The correct anti-saccads are the histogram filled here. You know, typically about 200 milliseconds correct anti-saccads. Here are the reaction times of the errors where they go towards the stimulus. You'll notice most of those here at 100 milliseconds, they are these express saccades, these reflexive movements. So let's look at a bit more detail now what happens on these saccad neurons in the superior colliculus and frontal eye fields. And here comes this visual burst. And in the correct anti-saccades, that's a solid line. When the monkey made errors, that's the dashed line. And you can see the signal is overall higher. It's not so much that the visual burst is greater. There's a huge difference in the background or the baseline activity that this visual response is riding on. So I just want to go through this for a sec because to me this is really cool. If you came down to the lab with us when Everling and I were doing these experiments, at this moment in time, before the stimulus even comes on, we can tell you if the monkey's going to screw up the trial or not. Based on how the excitability level in the circuit was set before the target even came on. So all of this early preparatory activity here, this is going to be crucial to set the excitability in this oculomotor circuit so that visual burst won't come through and drive an incorrect error on an anti-saccad trial. And so now I just want to speed through a little bit of uh, child development and some ADHD work showing how we now exploit this monkey neurophysiology and trying to understand what's going on. So I won't bother going through this again um, for the sake of time. Uh, actually, what I will say, we've now gone, Everling's been up here going through all the cortical areas, looking at anti-saccades in monkeys. We've gone extensively into the basal ganglia. There's fascinating stories there that we have in all of our papers. Um, what I want to do now is show, again, uh, repeat what Bayes started, showing uh, behavior of children on this anti-saccad task, but I really want to focus on where these express saccades come and these errors in the anti-saccad. So this is a cumulative distribution of uh, saccadic reaction times in the anti-saccad trial. This is for a group of children between the ages of five and eight, so there's 68 kids in here, thousands and thousands of saccades. And this is a cumulative distribution of the correct reaction times and the errors. And you'll see these young kids are horrible. They're making about 40% errors, almost a chance. It's not chance, though. You can see this evidence of a race because the errors come before the correct responses. Uh, when we look at children that are a little bit older, you see <coughs> sorry, less errors, more correct responses. This is starting to get steeper. The brain's maturing. But I want to blow up this epoch right here. That's what's shown over here. This, hundred, this, this little band of uh, reaction times here, which is when we get expressed saccades. And you'll see now, the older kids are actually doing worse than the younger kids up until this moment in time. They're making more errors. So we attribute this, that by the age of about eight or nine years of age, the circuit is now matured to adult levels for doing pro saccades. The problem is the circuit's not matured yet for the anti-saccades, and so these older kids are actually making more errors at the express range. They make fewer later errors, but they're making more express saccad errors. As we go to early teen years, 
less errors, more correct responses. This is getting steeper. Now they're getting control over these anti saccades And this advanced preparation is, is coming online. And uh, we'll go up to the Olympic athletes here, the young 20-somethings, the least errors, the most correct, steepest part of the curve. That's what we're all interested in this room, but since most of us are older than 24 years of age, there's a really sad story that starts to happen here. <laughs> Get ready for it. <laughs> That's what we all have to look forward to. But I'm gonna come back to the development now. Okay, so now we wanna look for these kind of signals, these developmental signals using fMRI and combined eye tracking, just like what Bea's been doing in her lab. And so we have a simple task with pro saccades and anti saccades. It's a rapid event design. I don't have time to go into that. We have catch trials because we want, what we're really interested in is this preparation epoch. That's the elegant neurophysiology that predicted the errors. Unfortunately, in a rapid event design, all the bold activity here smeared together. We can't sort it out. So we introduce correct tri or catch trials that have the preparation component, but no target ever comes on but they're matched here, so we can isolate the preparation here, and then we can take the preparation activity, suppress, uh, subtract it from the response activity to isolate the response. So if we look across children, here's three groups, eight to 12, 13 to 17, 20 to 25. Here's our nice smiley face we get. We focused on only five a priori regions of interest that are part of our ocular motor model, frontal eye field, supplementary eye field, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, the caudate and dorsolateral, and, uh, parietal eye field. So you see the typical network light up for the young kids and old kids. It's a lot more subtle what's going on. Here we've extracted just the voxels from the frontal eye fields to do a detailed analysis. And we're looking only at the activity aligned to execution. And you see across these age groups, there's really no difference for uh, across age here. The, the, the execution part appears to be mature. And we, we get uh, no correlation here uh, across age, but when we isolate the preparation epoch separately, now we see a big increase in activity with, a with age. This is the maturation signal coming in that's required to do this task. And we can see nicely how this signal is enhanced as we go through adolescent years. Uh, and finally, um, Joel, just before finally, we can do, and this is what we're really motivated to in my lab, now we're trying to go into that bold response and start to correlate components to behavior. And we think that we can go post hoc into the bold response and find elements that would predict behavior on a given trial, just like we do with the monkeys. And this just shows, whoops, that yes, it works in uh, frontal eye fields for sure with bold signal. I just have one second here to just show you a flash of data. We've now been looking at this in a number of tasks, or sorry, a number of patient groups where we combine eye tracking and fMRI, and I'm just gonna show you one, ADHD. In the pro-saccad task, so the, these are these cumulative distributions for control and ADHD subjects. The, the, the pink here is the ADHD. Pro-saccads, there's almost no errors. Look at all the express saccads these ADHD kid, or subjects make. These are young adults, actually, in this, in this study. So a huge increased number of expressed saccades. Way more reflexive, this kind of response coming out. On the anti-saccade task, a uh, lot less correct responses, more errors. Again, most of the errors in this express epoch, um, as we would have predicted. Um, so ADHD subjects often can't do this task. And on the contralateral side, this visual response is going to cross that threshold immediately to trigger an error. So we believe they do it. That's the pathology, we think, in ADHD as it links to our eye movement So task. So can we find a bold signal here that's changing or predicts in advance here that's going to be different for ADHD subjects in control? And I wouldn't have gone down this uh, whole path if I couldn't show you that. So the last data slide, just showing the bold signals we can extract in this preparation epoch Black are the, pro, or the control trials, pink again the ADHD trials. You see this hypoactivation in the oculomotor network in this preparation time when you're getting ready, when you're gonna be challenged with this. And so we think this is the neural correlate of the monkey physiology that I showed you and now we can start to go in detail in these bold signals to see how they correlate with behavior. And finally, it was a whole host of individuals helped me uh, do all of this work. I guess I should highlight, of course, I mentioned Everling with the monkey neurophysiology 
and Nadia Alian, who did the lion's share of the uh, human fMRI work. Thank you very much. If we would have given them more time to... When you saw that next, this is not going to go well with that, right? Oh, okay. I see what you mean. If you give them more time to go down, or is it just a lost trial? They have They're going to fail it. So typically, um, we have all kinds of variable delays working in this paradigm, so that monkeys are good, at, especially after being overtrained, at trying to guess everything. So we've got to keep them off their guard. But typically, monkeys won't get prepared until they know they need to be prepared. So those kind of preparation signals don't kind of come zooming up to nice levels until they know they have to use it. So if we give them more time, they're not going to use it to get ready. It'll probably just increase the more times where they break fixation and ruin the whole trial. Say that again. I didn't catch. Okay.